So good morning, good afternoon and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you are in the world. It is a great pleasure this afternoon to UK time, that is, to introduce you to the next series in the European ISRP section virtual webinar series. Today's webinar is on particulate pollution, the PM 2.5 crisis. So just a bit of background uh, around today's agenda. Uh, I'm just as, as chairman of the local section, I'm just going to give you a bit of background information on the section and what we aim to achieve in the society as a whole. And then we're going to run into our three keynote presenters from Professor Claire Holwell from the Durham University, Eric Van Velli from DuPont in Switzerland, and finally, our recorded presentation by Dr. Mike Logan, who uh, sends his apologies, but due to time differences around the world, he unfortunately isn't able to make the time slot today, so we've recorded his presentation. And then at the end, a little bit more around uh, future webinars, and then that will conclude the webinar. And then for members of the International Society for Respiratory Protection, there will be the section annual general meeting. So moving swiftly along. So for those who are new to the webinar series, uh, just a bit of background around the International Society for Respiratory Protection. We are a non-profit organization whose charter is to provide educational and informational service for any, anybody involved in respiratory protection. So we have six sections. Today's uh, webinar is being produced by the European section, but we also have an Americas, an Australasian, Japanese, Korean, and Greater China section. And the objectives of the society are, as I mentioned before, to enhance health and safety and persons of anybody interested in respiratory protection, to encourage the development of best practice, such as standards development, and the transfer of information to, to do with respiratory protection. So we're interested in promoting research and evaluation of respiratory protection through the encouragement of exchange of information, whether you're from a government organization, industry, organized labor, education, manufacturer, or any other professional organization. So the section itself is, is it's not just me, it is made up of a, a team of volunteers. Uh, this is the European section, so I have a great team behind me. Uh, many, some are on the call today. Uh, so again, great team. If anybody's interested, more information on the website listed at the bottom. In terms of the purpose of today for 2021, because of the COVID outbreak, rather than have face-to-face -face meetings, which are obviously problematical in current climate, we've created a, a wider educational program to come up with a series of theme topics around respiratory protection to introduce attendees to respiratory protection around various airborne hazards. In terms of this year, we've already given three webinars, one on face coverings at the very beginning of the year, one on national fit testing programs and one on the basics of respiratory protection standards, which can all be found on our YouTube channel. So if anybody's interested in viewing those webinars again, they're free to, uh, to watch. And also today's webinar will be recorded and made available for people to watch at their own leisure or rerun. So with, without further ado, it brings me on to today's webinar which as I've mentioned is on particulate pollution. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Claire Hallwell from the University of Durham, uh, where I studied many years ago. Claire is the chair of GeoHealth, uh, but she's also founder director of the International Volcanic Health Hazard Network and has provided a wealth of advisory capacity to organizations such as WHO, Public Health England, as well as the UK Cabinet Office. And with that, Claire, it's my great pleasure to open the floor to you, your good self for your presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. All right, can you just confirm that you can see that? Is that all good? Yep, we can see that, Claire. 
Thank you. All right. Uh, so I was a little bit cheeky and added uh, a little bit extra to my title because I want to address community protection in the context of particulate pollution today. Um, so I'll be taking you through some very basic information about what particulate pollution actually is, uh, what its effects are, but also how we can protect people and the public from um, these kinds of exposures. Um, so. All oh, right, that's not clicking on. One second. There we go. Thank you um, again for the introduction, by the way. Uh, that was really nice of you to do that. And I've just got a, a little bit more information about myself here that you can read in your own time if you want. But um, I guess what I wanted to say is, you know, I, I thought I'd give some background about why I am talking about particulate pollution. I, I am an environmental scientist. I have a PhD and a master's in volcanology, but really what, what my research is about is about the hazards and impacts of airborne particles, whether they are volcanic ash, industrial mineral dust, uh, desert dust, combusted vegetation, urban pollution, et cetera. And as well as working on the hazards and impacts, I work on community protection. So in order to do that kind of research, I need to work across a vast range of disciplines. And so even though I come from the earth and environmental sciences um, background, I work across medicine, psychology, social sciences, the exposure sciences, and also law and ethics. Um, my research was the first um, research that actually looked at the effectiveness of respiratory protection in volcanic settings, um, along with um, ISRP as partners. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about that research as the talk goes on. So as I said, I'm going to start at quite a basic level about what particulate pollution is. And that's because I understand that the audience today will be some people who are consolidating their information and some people who are learning new parts um, about respiratory protection and uh, the particles which impact it. So what is particulate pollution? Um, we also can call this particulate matter or PM, and I'll use both of those terms in this talk. I guess it's, it's a general term really for the solid particles, uh, which in this case are suspended in the air, because when we talk about particulate pollution, we're usually talking about air pollution. Now, the word particle um, can refer to many, many different compositions. Um, so there could be inorganic compounds, such as um, from agricultural emissions, so ammonium sulfate. We could be talking about sodium chloride from sea salt. We might be talking about various kinds of organic matter, even the skin that flakes off our bodies and is airborne in our houses, uh, or that uh, different types of particles which are re the result of combustion, like soot and smoke, vehicle exhaust, etc. Then we have particles from soil dust, from volcanic uh, eruptions, from quarrying and mining. Uh, there's tire and brake wear, which is a serious problem now in our cities. And of course, other kinds of biological materials like pollen and mold spores. Um, there's also a second category of particulates, uh, which are we describe as uh, secondary particles. And that means they actually don't start off as a particulate. Um, and usually they are formed in the air by chemical reactions uh, with gaseous pollutants. So for example, sulfur dioxide will react with the atmosphere to form sulfate aerosol. And actually aerosol is yet another term for tiny particulates. So the air that we breathe, both indoors and outdoors, always contains particles, but clearly we don't get ill from every particle we breathe. And also we don't describe every particle as pollution. So it really has to do with what the particle is made of and how much of it there is in the atmosphere and whether it's then going to have a health impact. Um, so some particles are large enough that you can see them with the naked eye and some are so small that you can really only detect them um, analytically using microscopes, for example, or maybe aerosol monitors out in the environment. And this is really important when it comes to human health. The size of the particle is actually critical. So uh, basically particles that are sub 10 micrometers in diameter can get very deep into your lungs and possibly can even translocate into your bloodstream from your lungs and then travel around your body and deposit in other organs and cells and cause problems within those areas of the body. 
Now, what does a 10 micron particle look like? It's hard to envisage. So the diagram in this um, slide will help with that. And what you can see here is a, a drawing of a human hair and also some beach sand. And beach sand could be, you know, maybe 90 micrometers in diameter and human hair is less than that. So if you took one of your hairs and chopped it in half, it would be roughly 50 to 70 micrometers in diameter. So what we're talking about here is particles which are even smaller than the width of a human hair, possibly five times smaller if we're talking about 10 micron particles and possibly much, much smaller, 20 times smaller if we're talking about 2.5 micron particles. And these particles are given uh, different terms, actually. We sometimes also call them PM10 or PM2.5, which effectively means particles sub 10 microns or sub 2.5 microns in diameter. Now, the smaller the particle, the, the deeper into the lung they can get, the more trouble they're likely to cause. And particles less than one micron or even 0.1 micron are the ones that might translocate around the body. But these are also the ones that are going to remain airborne in the atmosphere for longer than the heavier, denser particles. And these ones are going to be able to travel vast distances. And this is where we have the concept of transboundary pollution, where the pollution generated in one jurisdiction then moves into other areas, other countries, and therefore affects their particulate loads and therefore their compliance to regulations. And this can be a huge problem. Now, I'm not going to go into detail on this slide, but if you're interested to come back to it later, this shows where different sized particles deposit in the um, human respiratory system and basically shows that the particles sub 0.1 micrometers in diameter are most likely to get into the deep lungs. So let's move on to where particulate pollution is focused around the world. And here we have um, some maps uh, made uh, via computer simulations showing where particles are basically found around the world. Uh, this comes from an academic paper by Weigel et al, published in 2018. And what you can see in these different diagrams is that they have split up the different types of particulate pollution. So SIA in the top left is secondary inorganic aerosols. Um, then you've got organic mass as OM, BC as black carbon, carbon, SS as sea salt, et cetera. And if you have a look, you can see that basically you find particulates everywhere. Of course you do. Um, but there are certain parts of the world where the pollution is focused. And those are particularly, especially when you look at dust in the top right, uh, mineral dust that are focused in the world's desert areas. Um, for example, in Saharan Africa and the Gobi Desert, for example. But then we also see areas of the world which are badly affected because they are generators of anthropogenic pollution. So man-made pollution, such as through energy, um, energy resources and uh, different kinds of transport, etc. And so then this uh, map now actually shows the sources of particulate pollution rather than the types of particles. And in the top left, you see all sources. And again, here we're looking at a simulated map of total PM 2.5 mass. And you can see that again, we, we see particulate pollution is sourced from around the world, but that there are hotspots. And you can divide up the different sources of pollution into six primary anthropogenic categories. And you can see these listed as residential energy use, industry, power generation, agriculture, transport, and open fires. And these together make up 76% of the global PM 2.5 exposure. Now, if we look at uh, one or two of these in more detail, let's look at the top right image, residential energy use. You see that actually 21% of our exposures is sourced from residential energy use around the world. And that this is um, really particularly in places like Indonesia, sorry, uh, India and China. So areas that are very populated and also are not uh, highly developed yet. And the source of these uh, kind of residential uh, particulates is through biofuel use, diesel generators and burning of household waste. And elimination of solid fuel stoves over a 20 year period could actually avoid 22.5 million premature deaths associated with these exposures. So there's a lot of work to do around the world in terms of these types of emissions reduction. Um, 
down in the bottom right, you can see other sources. Now, these really are the non-anthropogenic sources, and they make up almost a quarter of our exposures. And these really uh, relate to mineral dust um, from desert areas, but also volcanic eruptions and other kinds of uh, short-term events are also included um, within, these, um, uh, within these categories. So we now understand that uh, there are many different sources of particulate pollution around the world. Um, and when we start thinking about the health effects, we need to actually understand the process that leads us from the source to the health effect itself. And it's not a simple process. So of course the source itself has to be emitting the pollutant. And there can be very, uh, well, there are many ways that you can actually try and uh, reduce the emissions. But once the pollutant is emit emitted, it becomes a uh, part of the airborne load or the concentration of particulate. And this can be monitored uh, environmentally um, using equipment around the world. But the concentration of particles in the air is not necessarily what you as a person are actually exposed to, because there are many different kinds of mitigating strategies that you can take to change your exposure. And so this might be, for example, wearing respiratory protection or staying indoors. And the route of exposure can also be different for different pollutants. And for um, uh, particulate pollution, we're most interested in inhalation routes. Now, thinking through to the health effect itself, actually, it's not even the exposure that we need to know about. It's actually the dose in the body. And the reason why exposure and dose are different is because if you inhale dust, you don't necessarily retain it all in your body. You then will exhale a portion of it, for example. And so the dose is what your body actually retains and what it will react to in order to produce a health impact. It can be really, really hard to measure dose. And so often exposure or airborne concentrations are used as a proxy. And that's what our regulations tend to be focused on. So moving on to the health effects of particulate matter, um, we are now very sure through some large meta studies, particularly the Revy Hat report produced by the World Health Organization in 2013, um, that particulate matter causes health effects after both short term, meaning hours or days, or long term, months to years of exposure. Unfortunately, there is no evidence of a safe level of exposure or a threshold below which no adverse effects occur. So this is why it becomes difficult to actually um, quantify and uh, have a definition for airborne pollution because there's not necessarily a level at which it becomes harmful. So as I explained previously, PM 2.5 or the, basically the smallest particles are uh, at higher risk of causing disease than the larger particles. And when I'm talking about diseases, we're mainly thinking about respiratory and cardiovascular diseases, such as asthma and heart disease. Although every day there are published studies showing how air pollution seems to affect different parts of the body. Every cell in the body has been found to have air pollution particles in it. And there are now studies about the impact of pollution on uh, a growth of uh, babies in the womb, on uh, brain development and all kinds of different aspects. And of course, we need to worry about mortality or death, um, early mortality, particularly from air pollution. And again, these tend to be due to cardiovascular and respiratory diseases, including lung cancer. So we know that the more pollution there is in the air, the more likely people are to die of it. And in fact, it's known that an increase of 0.2 to 0.6% of uh, PM10 per 10 micrograms uh, meter cubed of material um, can actually, uh, in, sorry, I think I said that wrong. Uh, daily mortality is estimated to increase by 0.2 to 0.6% per increase of 10 microgram per meter cubed of PM10. So it doesn't take much increase in PM10 in our atmosphere for there to start to be seen uh, increases in mortality. Um, susceptible groups are likely to be more impacted than healthy people, and by that I mean people with health, uh, pre-existing health problems such as lung or heart diseases, elderly people, 
but also children. And more and more evidence is uh, um, becoming available to show that um, exposure of particulates affects children's lung development, um, their lung function, and their growth rate. So this is going to have a knock-on impact because if you have a generation of children who have developed poorly, they're going to be less capable of adults at uh, having a productive life. And this will then um, uh, knock on into productivity of that country as a whole. So protecting children from air pollution, reducing their exposure so that they can have healthy lives is critical. One point I just wanted to also make is that actually at a population level, um, there's not really actually enough evidence at the moment to say that one type of particulate pollution is more hazardous than another type. Now that might sound strange because we know, for example, that in industrial exposures, for example, crystalline silica dust is known to be highly hazardous compared to some other kinds of dust. But at a community public level, it's not yet clear. There's not enough evidence as to which um, types of particles are going to be the most harmful. I think that evidence will come. But for now, the World Health Organization just says that particulate matter as a whole can cause these different types of diseases. Well, so it becomes clear then that we need to stop people being exposed to particulate matter. Um, the burden of air pollution around the world is significant. Uh, we need to manage air quality, we need exposure reduction strategies, and we need to reduce the health risks. And there are plenty of ways to do this. The primary way, of course, is to stop the emissions in the first place. And this can be at an industrial level, so changing different uh, energy uses, for example, switching to cleaner forms of energy which aren't going to generate particulates in combustion. But we can also do things at a personal level, for example, walking our children to school rather than driving. We also need to be regulating um, to reduce these emissions and these airborne concentrations. And of course, then there has to be sign up to those regulations at a global level and compliance to those regulations. But you need to be able to monitor compliance. And that means that better air quality monitoring is required around the world. And there are still plenty of countries which have almost no air quality monitoring and certainly not of a standard that's suitable for regulatory compliance. And finally, there is uh, personal protection. So actually stopping ourselves from being exposed to the particulate pollution. And we're gonna just look at that in a little bit more detail. There are several different models that are used to kind of uh, intervene to stop people being exposed or to get ill or dying from different kinds of hazards. Uh, these are called public intervention models. And in the case of uh, environmental models, there are four components. There's the public themselves and the disease that they will get and the fact that they will die. And then there's what's actually causing this problem, which is in this case, the environment. So the clinical intervention model that you can see at the top here basically is the medical model. So when uh, doctors will actually come in and stop you dying by halting a disease in its tracks, by curing the disease or, you know, uh, trying to reduce its level so that you don't die. <clears throat> um, what we're really talking about when we're talking about air pollution is uh, on a large global scale is the public, inter public health intervention model, which is where we actually try and stop the environment or the air pollution from causing disease. And the way we do that, as I just explained, is through process controls, emissions reduction and exposure reduction. However, people are not necessarily willing to wait for that to happen and for their environment to be cleaned up by someone else. People want to take matters into their own hands and protect themselves. And this is called the environmental stewardship model, where basically you stop the public from actually being exposed to the environment in the first place. And if you can do that, then you stop the disease from forming and therefore the deaths. This requires social and behavioral change. Um, now we started to see this um, not just through public health interventions and through government interventions, but through personal decisions, starting in China in 2003, when the SARS crisis meant that respiratory protection was worn by the public in a large scale for the first time. And following that crisis, people continued to wear respiratory protection to stop themselves being exposed to air pollution. And now, of course, with the 
global pandemic with COVID-19, we are starting to see the normalization of respiratory protection around the world. And it will be interesting to see whether this means that people will start to now use respiratory protection more to protect themselves from air pollution. So this is about personal behavior change, but it's also about risk communication. So it's about governments trying to change behavior by communicating the risk to the public. So looking a bit more closely about at the public use of respiratory protection in crises and PM crises, as mentioned, um, some Asian countries have already been wearing respiratory protection in a non-occupational setting for quite a while now. Like I said, China started with infection control and moved on to air pollution. In Japan, Japan also started with infection control, but I don't think so much people wear masks there still today for air pollution problems. It's more to do with uh, fashion trend and also some social pressures. However, in Indonesia, Vietnam and Thailand, which are three countries that I know about, uh, people are now commonly wearing respiratory protection to protect themselves from air pollution. And this is particularly people who are trans uh, traveling on public transport or personal transport, such as scooters. And you can see in the top right image here, um, people wearing kind of cloth masks. This is very, very common in Indonesia, Vietnam and Thailand to protect themselves from pollution. And so mainly these countries are wearing cloth masks or which are also called fashion masks or scooter masks there and also uh, surgical masks. But there is growing concern that people who are doing this are not understanding the efficacy of these masks. They will take more risks because they think they are protected and therefore they will have a false sense of security. And I've put a link to a paper there if you're interested in looking at that. Now, there are other kinds of reasons why people, the public, wear particulate pollution masks, um, particularly in non-anthropogenic particulate crises. So, for example, natural crises such as volcanic eruptions and wildfires. Now, in my experience, until recently, uh, non-governmental organisations and governmental organisations commonly distributed surgical or other cheap masks in these uh, crises in lower middle income countries. They, this was because they already had these masks stockpiled for pandemic reasons. And it's going to be interesting to see whether they can afford to give these out in particular crises during COVID. Also, uh, non-governmental organizations governmental organizations and also mask manufacturers have distributed or donated N95 or FFP2 masks, mainly in high income countries. So on the bottom right, um, there's a photo here of people being given N95 masks in Hawaii in the 2018 volcanic crisis there. Um, in my experience until about five or so years ago, this was the norm, was that people in, the Ameri in North America and in Iceland and places like that would get the best masks in volcanic eruptions and people in Indonesia would be given substandard masks. Uh, this inequality, I believe, is now slowly changing. And um, actually, this is partly due to a project called Health Interventions in Volcanic Eruptions, which I led and which ISRP were partners on. So this was the first research to try to um, uh, quantify the effectiveness of different kinds of respiratory protection worn by communities across the world when there is a volcanic eruption. And I haven't got time, unfortunately, to tell you about the project in detail, but I'm just going to show you some final results. Um, this rather messy graph uh, shows filtration efficiency of a range of different materials used by communities around the world in volcanic eruptions. So in the lab, we measured the filtration efficiency against uh, PM 2.5 particles in two types of volcanic ash and also aloxite, which was an analog uh, dust that we used when we were next going to um, expose our volunteers. I'll talk about that in a minute. So what you can see in this diagram is that um, in the uh, top right, I hope you can see my, my mouse, in the top left, apologies, you can see N95 masks uh, and N99 masks, which not surprisingly performed extremely well with almost 100% filtration efficiency. 
uh, surgical masks and actually some of the cheap masks that are handed out by agencies in eruptions actually also performed very well. Um, this is a, actually a mask designed to capture PM 2.5 particles. But then you can see that uh, as you move into the fashion masks and the scooter masks and the nuisance dust masks, the efficacy or the efficient filtration efficiency drops off substantially. And here, when you reach the single layered materials, so cloth materials, we see that in fact, sometimes the particles passed straight through the masks. So we also um, tested what it would be like if we took a bandana and folded it several times and whether that would include the filtration efficiency. So here is one time, two times and three times. So it did work, it did improve it a little bit, but still nowhere near as good as wearing a surgical mask. Um, or rather, I should say the filtration efficiency of a surgical mask. Uh, also, many agencies around the world actually recommend people wet their masks. And it wasn't clear to us that this had any improved filtration effect. So we tested it. And here is a bandana wetted and folded three times compared to the dry one three times. And you can see it actually performed worst. The same was for surgical masks. This is the wet surgical mask here and the dry surgical mask up, up here. So wetting does not help. So we then took the best performing masks and we asked volunteers to wear them in the laboratory uh, and we tested here total inward leakage. So this takes into account the fit of the mask as well as its filtration. So you see the same filtration results as you just saw on the previous slide. And here we have the leakage. So the least leakage, which is what you want, um, was for the N95 style mask. Um, if you have a regular surgical mask, we had around 35% total inward leakage. So not terrible, but certainly not as good as the PM10 mask. But the PM10 mask was not comfortable to wear and the surgical mask was much more comfortable to wear. So compliance is likely to be higher. Here you see this uh, cheap uh, mask that performed very well, um, which is actually a highly efficient mask, but when you wear it, it flops around your face and has poor leakage. We also had an enhanced surgical mask from Japan that again is designed to be worn for air pollution exposures and has some added uh, features to make it fit better, cheek and chin flaps. And indeed it improved its efficiency a little bit. We also tested what would happen if you wore a regular surgical mask and a piece of cloth on top and whether that would improve the fit and therefore the leakage. And so here with a, band, uh, a mask and a bandage on top, it improved the, um, the leakage by about 10%. But of course, this was not particularly comfortable. But this was all done in laboratory conditions. We also conducted some wearability surveys in Indonesia. You can see on the left here, a woman wearing these same masks. You can see this mask here and just how enormous it is on her face and how poorly it protects her despite having excellent filtration efficiency. These field trials basically found the same uh, kind of rankings of comfort as we saw in the laboratory. So surgical masks being the most comfortable and N95 masks or wearing a, a cloth on top of a mask being least comfortable. So what we found in our research was that there seemed to be this kind of um, ethical issue that agencies were going to face when deciding what kind of face mask to distribute to communities affected by wildfires or volcanic eruptions, for example. They basically have two choices. On the left is the precautionary principle. This is the principle that some protection is better than no protection and it's better to hand out whatever masks you've got in supplies, uh, such as surgical masks. On the other hand, you have the principle of effectiveness, which is that only effective protection should be offered. And in a way, this is the first principle of humanitarian aid, that you should not be harming the people that you're aiming to help. You should only be giving effective interventions. And so we did quite a lot of work around this and, um, you know, trying to explain to agencies the findings of our studies in the laboratory, etc. And as a result of this, a lot of agencies have tried to switch now to offering better forms of protection. And the reason they've done that is because they've realized that there are ways that they might be able to afford uh, that kind of um, mask, for example, uh, by crowdfunding or by asking manufacturers for donations. And this happened in the Agung eruption in Indonesia um, two years ago. So, 
What we also found, though, of course, is that there are going to be some agencies, particularly governmental agencies in low and middle income countries, which cannot afford to purchase these masks and don't have the mandate to either. And in that case, we uh, are kind of uh, trying to get across the message that they must tell the people that they're providing the intervention to that this intervention may not offer them a very good level of protection, and therefore they may have to take some other um, actions in order to reduce their exposure. And the way to do this is really through public communication. And so we spent a lot of time developing public information products. So that's um, the following video, uh, sorry, leaflets, posters and booklets that you can see here, but also a range of videos um, so that uh, agencies could actually provide this information rapidly in an eruption. And these are endorsed by the World Health Organization. And we actually involved local community members and local agencies in developing these products so that we could make sure that they were actually useful and were going to be used. The other thing that we did was make sure that people actually understood how to use these masks if they were going to be given them. And so with ISRP, we conducted a train the trainer workshop in Indonesia. Uh, we, stain, sorry, we trained stakeholder representatives in how to fit face masks and the reps then trained each other and so that they in turn were ready to then go out and train many more people. And now more than 1000 people have been trained in this uh, region of Indonesia near Merapi volcano. And we'd like to be able to do a lot more of this in the future. So to conclude, I'm sure that particulate matter crises such as wildfires will worsen with climate change. We're seeing that already, it's very clear. However, over time, anthropogenic PM sources will lessen with implementation of effective emissions reduction strategies in the energy production sectors and transport. And hopefully we'll start to see this in the future in currently developing countries. But in the meantime, people won't put up with poor air quality. They are taking matters into their own hands. They want personal protection. And COVID-19 has opened the world's eyes to respiratory protection. It has become an acceptable social norm. And we can expect to see that people are going to start to wear the protection they've got used to wearing for COVID-19 for other purposes. But the problem is that we still have a lot of missing evidence about the efficacy of face masks for community use, particularly for children. Um, and it's becoming more common that children are wearing face masks, not just for COVID-19. So I have a new project called Face Up, Factors Affecting Childhood Expo Exposures to Urban Particulates, which again, ISRP is a partner on, where we will be testing the effectiveness of face masks for children. But I also think that better public information is required to inform the world of the efficacy of different types of uh, respiratory protection for different purposes and the suitability of that protection for different susceptible groups. And I think this is why ISRP is so important. I think there's so much work that we can do together to try and develop these resources and try and raise awareness around the world. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Claire, for a fantastic presentation. Uh, very informative. There are just a few questions. Uh, I'm just going to start in the order that we received. Uh, so we have an, an anonymous question uh, in the chat box. Is there a natural formal de definition for respiratory protection? <laughs> Well, that's a really good question. And I, I'm probably least qualified to answer this on the call, I would think, because there's so many more people on the call who are experts in respiratory protection. Um, my understanding is that in industry, the term respiratory protection or respiratory protective equipment is very specific to, uh, you know, masks that have been developed for use in industry and certified to certain standards. Um, with COVID-19, all kinds of different terminology has been used with face masks and face coverings. Uh, I think there's a lot of confusion out there about which terminology to use, but as respiratory protection, such as disposable N95 masks are being used more by the public, I think these terms are, are kind of conflating and are being used more commonly. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Uh, and then, then we have, I'm gonna combine in the interest of time, I'm gonna combine the two and it's around your testing of, of the various uh, masks, respirators, uh, materials. Uh, and it's 
how was the total inward leakage measured? Uh, and and Menno's follow on question uh, from Karen's question was the same for the field measurement. How was that done? Okay, so first of all, the field measurement was not a measurement of total inward leakage. It was just a, a social survey of wearability. Um, so in that um, circumstance, we had people uh, actually walking around a school playground when when Ash was actually falling and um, wearing respiratory protection, then filling in surveys. Um, and I can the, the article is linked to in my uh, talk and you'll have a copy of the talk. Um, in terms of the total inward leakage um, tests in the laboratory, this was done at the Institute of Occupational Medicine, Edinburgh, and uh, we had a chamber set up um, which had <clears throat> um, uh, surrogate dust, aloxide, being lofted into that chamber, and then volunteers went in wearing uh, protection. They were they were they were wearing goggles and everything else as well, but they had face masks on, which had had a, basically a hole drilled into the front, um, so that we could measure the um, particulate inside the mask. And then also the um, each volunteer was wearing a small uh, TSI. Uh, side pack, so a small aerosol monitor on on their on their uh, waist, which had um, uh, a tube in the breathing zone, so that we could compare what they were, what was the dust outside their um, mask to what was inside, and then you compare the difference inside and outside in terms of concentration of particles. Okay, thank you. And then just a very final question, in the interest of time. Uh, how do you approach the fit testing of underage participants in your new project? Yeah, well, we haven't started the project yet. It's based in Indonesia and Nepal, and we can't go there at the moment. And our partners in the country aren't allowed to work. But what is going to happen is that we'll be using um, fit testing equipment. Um, so uh, Coulter uh, particle counter. And um, basically, it all goes through ethical approval. The children not, are not put in uh, any kind of dangerous situation. Uh, they are in their normal environment, which sadly is quite polluted, which is why we've chosen those locations. Uh, so outdoors and um, we'll be then using a, a normal fit testing procedure to, fit, to test how well the, part, uh, the mask fit to their faces. In the interest of time, I know James has asked another question. If you're happy, Claire, what we will do is further questions received, we will post them to you. And if you can answer them and then we will post them on the website as, as answers, if that's OK with you. Yes, yeah, certainly. Brilliant. So thank you very much for that fantastic talk. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so just moving on. To our next speaker. So hopefully everybody can see my screen. So moving on to our next talk. So Claire has, has, has given us a background information on, on the origins of particulate pollution. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Eric uh, from DuPont Technologies in Switzerland, who is going to talk about the latest technological innovations around protecting against particulate pollution. So Eric has been with DuPont for nearly 30 years. Uh, is very well known within the European and International Standards Committee uh, community from a protective clothing perspective. Uh, he's on various ISO, SEN and SENELEC committees, uh, and he works for DuPont as their global regulatory affairs manager, holding a bachelor's degree in chemistry and also a master's degree in law from the University of Lucerne. So with, with that, Eric, I will pass the floor over to you. It's a great pleasure. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let me try to share my screen. And please let me know if you see my screen. Yep, we can see and, that, Eric. And does it, does it work in presentation mode? Yes, it seems to be working. Yep. Tell me if it doesn't. Um, so I'm not a specialist in respiratory protection, so um, that's not my area of expertise. I do sit in one of the committees uh, just as a liaison uh, between protective clothing and um, respiratory protection. I look much more at garments, um, and I'll try to explain some of those things uh, as I go along. Um, DuPont uh, is active in a lot of protective clothing. We do not 
do the respiratory side. Uh, we do thermal protection, mechanical protection, uh, emergency response, uh, chemical protection and control environments, uh, which is more looking at controlling the products rather than controlling or protecting people. Um, I'm not gonna read all my slides. I'm just gonna go through them. Um, you will have the slides uh, and the uh, presentation. So from that perspective, you should be able to go uh, read more detail if you want to. Um, I'm gonna try to explain why particulates are an issue outside of respiratory as well. That's really the, the, the key part. How are some of the standards addressing these issues and should face and respiratory protection match uh, garment protection basically from that perspective as well. Um, so why are particulates uh, protection, what should that protection be extended uh, from respiratory protection? Uh, you may have you know, heard in, in at least North America, Europe, quite a few discussions around cancer and firefighters. And that's really where we're coming, we're starting from. Uh, from that perspective, this is an example of, of wildfires in, in this case. Um, and so that's really where I, I start my talk. Um, basically the exposure routes of toxic substances, usually in, in most cases, at least, um, Firefighters and workers wear um, respiratory pr protection, whether it's an SCBA or other types of respiratory protection. Uh, they wear clothing to protect them. Um, uh, but is that enough? And that's really the question that's been asked quite a few times. And uh, the questions on, on cancer have been ongoing for firefighters and whether there's a direct causal link or not uh, is in discussion. Um, we see higher levels of cancer at firefighters, therefore it's a concern, um, yet you can't directly attribute it uh, to one, uh, one source of exposure or um, um, specific elements of that exposure, I would say. So how can you get exposed? Inhalation, uh, that's really usually protected by respiratory protection, skin contact, um, that's usually something that's not looked at and you'd assume that with protective clothing, you'd be protected and then through ingestion. And most people don't ingest um, gases or particulates. Uh, it's mostly then due to a poor um, cleanliness of your hands and so on. That might be the case uh, for ingestion from that perspective. So, um, there was a test done um, by uh, um, University of, um, or with the University in, in the US uh, to look at skin absorption rates and protection. And so they had firefighters run through what is called a FAST test, which is a fluorescent aerosol screening test. Uh, and then see where do you have deposits of different particulates using their normal protective gear. Uh, so your respiratory, the normal clothing, um, the fire hoods and so on. And you're doing the test uh, with a wind speed of 10 miles per hour or about 16 kilometers an hour uh, with you know different particle size uh, particulates from 0.1 to 10 uh, microns. Uh, and then this test is being carried out uh, for about 30 minutes. Um, so, you know, that being done, uh, also to try to calibrate that is to look at, depending on where the uh, particulates are deposited, what's your potential for your skin to absorb the, um, the particulates? And if you look at that, there are different parts of the body that um, absorb four times faster. For example, if you look at the jaw versus the forearm uh, and so, those are critical areas to look at as well from the absorption rates. Um, and then the question was, okay, if you're looking at the total equipment of a firefighter, can you do something easily to improve their equipment uh, from that perspective and therefore looking at the cost of, of the various equipment? Um, from that, we started some work internally. Could we create something, to be honest? Uh, normal uh, fire hoods are usually made of two layered materials, which is basically two nits, and that protects basically the firefighter from heat. That's the purpose. 
Um, and if you look at this slide that I was showing, uh, and that's what I forgot to do, you saw basically here quite a lot of uh, deposit, some in the legs and some in the, in the groin and wrist areas. So all areas where you would have basically overlaps of, of material. Um, and so this was being looked at. Uh, so we decided to try to put a, a, a nano layer barrier material between. Uh, there's this barrier here. And, but at the same time, you need to try to make sure that basically the garment or the fire hood in this case provides you the right uh, level of, of protection. On the one hand, it's durable enough and um, it has the particle fertilization that you want, but also doesn't create heat stress. So I'm gonna go through some of these points reasonably quickly. So filtration, um, very quickly we worked with, um, or at least my colleagues in the US worked with uh, NFPA 1971, which is the standard for turnout gear for the firefighters to really try to um, have a test there that could test the amount of particulates going through um, a fire hood, for example, in this case. This was optional. Um, in the, uh, in the standard still is for the time being, to see can we block something and, and what can be created. Um, we started creating a number of you know, materials that could do the filtration. Um, we had a first generation, I would call it a, a quilted material that you saw in the, in the picture. Uh, we are now also working on some, a number of laminates from that perspective. Um, the requirement that was set in the standard um, in the NFPA standard was more than 90% um, particulate um, filtration efficiency. Um, and But at the same time, we wanted to look more broadly than that is does it have uh, viral as well as bacterial filtration efficiency due to the questions that are being raised with COVID and other situations from that perspective. Um, then naturally we want to make sure that when you do the test, does it work? Um, not just the filtration efficiency, but can you really see it work? Uh, so we did a number of tests where we basically looked at the fire hood um, being tested, uh, again, in, in the same uh, type of um, system or in uh, wear trials. In this case, it's wear trials. And you can see the outside of the hood, uh, if you look at this image, uh, is blackened. Uh, when you turn it inside out, you really see that basically it looks pretty clean. Uh, if you take a traditional hood that would be constructed without the um, nanofiltration barrier, you see that it goes through. Um, even in a you know 15 minute um, test area or um, equipment, uh, when you consider that most firefighters work at least in a fire, up to you know 30 minutes and in wildfires even much longer. Um, so we did the same test basically using a um, respiratory protection to see you know can you control it uh, and does it really work from that perspective? Here it's done on um, dummy heads basically that are used used also for um, testing uh, respiratory protection and basically using the same fast test. Um, would that would the system pass with or without? Um, and then you see the pictures without the, the barrier material uh, and with the barrier material from that perspective. Then uh, filter efficiency. Um, depending on the generation of materials, you see the first two materials that are laminates uh, pass very high. Uh, if you just use the older one, you have about 40% barrier, which is already something that's important, but uh, probably not sufficient from that perspective. Thermal protection. Um, if you look at normal uh, thermal protection, you're expecting, you know, um, of uh, fire hood about, you know, a 10 or a um, 12 for the, um, developed material, uh, the laminate. Uh, so you basically see also, even though the uh, you're adding a slight, very thin layer, uh, also adding the, um, the thermal protection significantly from that perspective. 
The question is then, what's the effect on comfort um, later on? We also did tests uh, from that perspective using um, a thermal mannequin system um, that you see on the, in the ASTM standard, uh, which is basically a, a mannequin that's tested with um, eight to 12 uh, burners uh, generating two calories or 84 kilowatts for an exposure uh, you know, as long as needed. In this case, it was done for, for two seconds. Uh, to see, you know, would you have any issues from that perspective uh, on the fire hood in itself, itself, or um, the different parts uh, inside it. Don't forget, a, a fire hood like that will be worn inside the helmet. So you're trying to see, um, you know, just in itself, does it protect at least minimally uh, from that perspective? Um, then the question of comfort and durability are, are critical. Uh, one, the air permeability um, is, is quite high uh, from that perspective. Both the THLs are, are well within the, uh, the requirements of both you know, NFPA 1971 and 1977 um, and have very high, basically, air permeability from that perspective as well. Um, if you look at other man motion management um, test methods that are there, um, whether it's absorption time, um, you know, the absorption time is, is much faster, therefore, it will allow to um, evaporate also uh, quite fast uh, from that perspective. The amount absorbed is lower, uh, which is positive, and then the um, absorption um, grounds for minutes and the evaporation rates. Um, so the high absorption rate allows you know, to remove sweat quickly. The high evaporation rate allows to dry the water off the, uh, the thermal liner. Uh, and therefore the reduced water also avoids steam burns and, and other items like that. Uh, as this was done also in, in wear trials, we've seen quite a bit of positive feedback also from firefighters uh, from, a com from a comfort perspective, but also fit, better hearing, and also just cleanliness around uh, face um, and so on. Durability, um, this was done both also on uh, just washing, uh, which is done uh, frequently, wash and dry cycles um, uh, as per the NFPA uh, 1851. Um, and seeing, you know, do you lose either uh, filtration efficiency uh, and do you have deformation uh, if you do uh, doffing and, and doff, uh, donning and doffing uh, after uh, those uh, cleaning cycles? And we basically have seen that irrespective of particulate size, the efficiency basically remains uh, identical or close to identical, I say slightly lower, but basically close to identical. Then law, the um, dimensional stability, and here we've looked at both um, our own material, but also other materials that exist on the market. Um, and basically, depending on the wash number of wash cycles, we see quite a few of those uh, materials meeting the requirements, uh, whether it's um, durability, also shrinkage uh, to a certain extent. So what's happening at the standard level? Are we, you know, so the NFP 1971, which is the turnout gear, uh, already implemented at least a um, something for the uh, fire hoods. They're considering it now for also the garments to see if they could insert something in there. Um, the Wideland uh, wa uh, standard are, are being discussed at the NFPA to actually provide that. Uh, there's been a, a lot of work done um, for cleaning and care uh, for, for uh, garments uh, to ensure that the contamination is removed and removed uh, quickly. Um, on the ISO side, we've been a little bit slower in, in adopting some of these. Um, today, we have the fire hoods for um, Wildland that has been adopted with uh, an optional particulate protection. Uh, there's a cleaning standard that's similar, 
two, but different from the NFPA 1971 that has been adopted, uh, as well as a new selection care, use and care and maintenance uh, standard. And actually both of those two standards cover all the PPE for firefighters, not just uh, garments. And therefore it's a, those are quite comprehensive documents to look at both care maintenance and cleaning and inspection. Um, the, there's a number of norms that are on the right in, in write-up and that those are in red actually, I should have said that. So for turnout gear, the firehood uh, standard is being rewritten uh, that will include at least a um, optional particular protection or a mandatory one. There's some discussion in, in both of those, uh, as well as some discussions around the uh, turnout gear itself, the garments, uh, whether that should include optional particular protection or not. The EN norms are not as far advanced, uh, at least not the turnout gear one, which was just adopted in 2020. Um, it did have a, a separate membrane requirement in, in general uh, uh, from the level one and two, uh, which are look, just looking at, at thermic uh, protection or thermal protection. And the firehood standard is being drafted to include a very similar uh, particulate protection that the uh, NFPA 1971 um, has in it uh, from that perspective. Just to talk about Wineland a little bit more. Um, so the proposal that's there that's being discussed is to have 90% uh, blocking performance for the garment. Um, and so that's being pushed uh, very strongly uh, in the US from that perspective um, and seem to be achievable uh, from different uh, garment manufacturers uh, from that perspective. Uh, if you look at, I mean, for our products, we have the data, um, whether it's from one or the other laminate, um, the, it would meet the other performance requirements that would be there, whether it's from a heat perspective uh, or from a uh, tear uh, THL perspective uh, or even shrinkage perspective. So from, from that perspective, it, it's feasible to have for the whole body a good particulate protection in uh, firefighter gear for, for Wildland. You have to understand that Wildland gear is, is single layered, uh, which makes that much more difficult to achieve and then was a multi-layered uh, turnout gear. So the single layer is really, again, a, a, an outer shell um, that's quite solid. The um, nanomaterial, that's the, the, the barrier, and then uh, an inner layer, which is also a, a lining, which is a knit for comfort perspective. Um, Again, then the question is, how do you, can you keep it clean and, and does it work both uh, removing the particulates and blocking um, the uh, chemicals? So some initial studies uh, have been done uh, with washing looking both as received and uh, after washing. And we can see that basically the contaminant is, is largely removed from that perspective. Uh, and if you look at the um, the, the the chemical side, um, if you look at it, um, the major chemicals, they are either they are non-detect uh, going uh, once laundered, basically all of it is, is el eliminated. So not only do you block the particulates from going in, but at the same time, uh, any chemicals that are deposited on it, you're able to basically uh, ensure that um, they're no longer there after washing as well. And it doesn't go through, uh, through either silene extraction, um, basically as the firefighter is sweating. Um, so you're doing it basically looking at both cleaning and um, going through the garment uh, through basically sweat. Now I would like to go to one further aspect. Um, should the respiratory protection match that of the garment? Now this is not really to try to say they should be exactly identical. That's not the purpose here. 
uh, but really, do you need to have similar protection? Um, and, and again, I think that's an important perspective that we today uh, saw actually with the COVID um, situation where we suddenly had to wear masks even in our labs and things like that. And we were uh, actually quite um, at, at a difficult situation when we were using whether it's a surgical mask or an N95 or FFP2 mask in Europe, um, that some of them have only minor protection from a heat and flame perspective. Uh, that's not their purpose either. From that, uh, for that, you frequently have either SCBAs or, or, or um, greater uh, RPD um, type um, protection. And the social distancing masks really had no requirement whatsoever uh, from, from that perspective. But at the same time, if you work in a thermal lab, uh, you want to be able to have a minimum protection. So we started looking actually for our own pers personnel uh, as a starting point um, because we believe that the mask should match the garment that you're wearing, or at least provide you a very similar type uh, protection. So we started looking at face masks um, from that perspective, what it was for ourselves, and then looked at it uh, broad, more broadly uh, there. And so we started looking at, you know, what standards could we use to basically do some testing, uh, both the NFPA 9, uh, 2112, uh, or I would say the close to equivalent ISO 11612 uh, and the ASTM uh, 15026 or the ISO 13506, uh, which is the thermal mannequin test, would be good ways of testing uh, these types of, of masks to see, you know, would it work? And we decided to do some tests from, the, from that perspective, uh, looking at um, a Nomex mask uh, that provides maybe not 90% uh, protection uh, for, for uh, particulates, but close to it. Um, and then, you know, could you use an existing um, face mask from for with carbon filtration or could you use um, water resistant face masks that are uh, on the market and both of them actually cause a number of problems one either because they burnt or or melted um, or basically uh, the elastic bands basically dropped off so in a situation like that you either could have something sticking to your face or providing no protection whatsoever um, and that's how we came up with basically providing either mask with you know a nano uh, type particulate barrier or uh, more comfort uh, masks um, with just um, a Nomex barrier. And thank you for your attention. Well, that's fantastic, Eric. Thank you very much. That's. Uh... For me, that's a great overview of kind of how important a PPE ensemble is, including the respiratory protection, because it's not just your airway that could potentially absorb contaminants that could cause physiological harm. So, no, that, that was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, and maybe just the last parting shot, I forgot to say something, but um, if you look at wildland firefighters, they don't usually wear respiratory masks. And I think that's one area where more work needs to be done from that perspective. Yeah, uh, and it's interesting to see, especially with Claire's talk about how face coverings were predominantly previously looked at from a SARS, from a, a biological disease perspective, but now they're being looked at for firefighting examples, uh, et cetera, potential in, in hospitals and hotels uh, for, for fire applications, for, for egress. Uh, uh, and I'm just sorry, I'm all fingers and thumbs today. So uh, just one question on the on the chat box from Mike Williams. Uh, presumably, presumably the evaporative heat loss is by diffusion. Yes, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> if I'm thinking of the test. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and. There are no other uh, 
questions in the chat box, Eric. I think you've you've stunned everybody into silence with such a great talk. But that that for me was great because it, again, as I mentioned, it shows the the overlap between respiratory protection uh, and kind of the more April ensemble style, which is just as important when you're considering working in these other environments. So thank you very much, Eric, with that. Quite that welcome. Great job. So thank, thank you, you for the time. So then moving along to our final presentation for today's webinar, which as I mentioned previously, is a recording uh, from Dr. Mike Logan, who unfortunately can't join us mainly due to the time difference between uh, Central Europe and Queensland in Australia. So Mike has kindly recorded this previously with myself and, and Michael Parham. So Dr. Mike Logan is the Director of Research and Scientific Branch within Queensland Fire and emergency services. If my sorry, gone one too far. Uh, so Mike is is a very senior officer within Queensland Fire and Rescue Services. They they cover a huge area, approximately 1.7 million square kilometers, and they've got more than 40,000 volunteer and employed staff. Uh, so Mike is is one of their technical leads. Uh, he's got a wealth of background in wildlife, wildfire determination, research, and also mitigation procedures. He's also done a huge amount of work in CBRN within the Australian government. Uh, so he's very authoritative in some of the things that Eric was just talking about in terms of, of mitigating wildfires. And with that, I will pass over to Michael Parham, who is our IT expert on, on the webinar, who will now run Mike's presentation. My name is Mike Logan. I'm with the Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. I run what's called the Research and Scientific Branch. I will give you a little bit of an idea about what we actually do as we come over the next few slides. You can see on the page here a couple of images of some of our response vehicles. But today, what I'm going to talk about is what does science have to do with protecting firefighters? And I want to give, when, you've, when we finish this presentation, I want to leave a couple of challenges to the audience, but also leave the audience with some idea of what we actually do, both operationally and in a research sense to improve our understanding of exposures to firefighters, other emergency responders and the community. And we're going to focus with two snapshots today. Um, and hopefully that will give you an idea of the breadth of the work that we actually do. We're going to give a little insight to some work we've been doing with urban firefighters on understanding their exposures and also some work we've been doing on Wildfire fire, fire, firefighters, which for us is typically we call bushfire uh, firing, firefighting, and looking at their exposures with the clear aims of understanding what that means and what we can do about it. And then we'll give you some insight into what we're doing with this. But as I said, I'm then going to pose some questions to the audience, both um, researchers, operators, and manufacturers to think about how we can improve this into the future. And we'll give you a couple of hints on um, some other work we're doing as well. So um, as you guys go soon, we'll have lots of pretty pictures. Now, to give you an idea of who we are, Queensland Fire and Emergency Services, our response area is about 1.7 million square kilometres. Now, in most terms for Americans, that's about one third of the United States. For Europe, that's basically all of Western Europe and some, including Brexit uh, or the UK. Okay, We have about 242 urban stations, more than 1,500 rural stations, as we call them. We have what's called um, state emergency services and volunteer marine rescue and all that sort of stuff. We have more than 40,000 staff and volunteers. So we are a very large agency over a large geographical area. Okay, The drawback is, 
we only have about 5 million people in our state. Okay? But we respond to more than 70,000 incidents a year. We almost have seasons where they get bushfires or disasters for cyclones. And obviously we have the other technological hazards and incidents. We make uh, a lot of sodium cyanide, ammonium nitrate. Um, we export more than 20 million tonnes of LNG. So it gives you a bit of an idea. Um, we have a lot of interests. Okay. Now my area is research and scientific branch. And our function is to provide that expertise to manage hazardous materials, emergencies, and large fires, and anything a bit different. To make that happen across our state, okay, we obviously have those two vehicles. They have a lot of equipment on board, a lot of high-end detection, modeling, uh, information sources, and odds and ends to fix problems. Okay, but to provide this service across our state, we have seven what we call scientific officers, five at PhD level, two of them are permanently on call. We have a relationship with Queensland Health who also support us um, and we're very fortunate with that relationship. But, but even more importantly, we have about 55 volunteers drawn across the state. These are chemists and chemical engineers. And from an emergency response point of view, what that means is that you can get high-end technical advice from local experts to support a police officer or a fire officer to manage an emergency. We do about 500 incidents a year. So we are busy, okay? And when we're not doing that, we're actually preparing for incidents or training people okay, to improve the way or, and improve the way we do business. In our spare time, we do a little bit of research. But that research is focused on questions of interest the Queensland Fire and Emergency Services. And the, my area seems pretty popular. We also provide this expertise to other jurisdictions across Australia and New Zealand. So if you have our magic number, we'll do our best to help you. Okay, we have information on more than a million materials and processes. Uh, we've got more than 10 modeling programs, okay, a digital library of more than 30, 31,000 documents. So we have a lot of stuff to help us provide the best expertise to manage a hazardous materials emergency. And we'll give you an example of that as we go through um, the session from that as we as we work through. Now to give you an idea you know, on our resourcing and just what that means for over this huge geographical area, okay, we obviously deal in hazardous materials emergencies. We are, in many respects, quite a sophisticated user. Okay, um, I've give, just given you outlines there of the sort of stuff. Um, we have various types of chemical protective, biological protective clothing. Um, some look like moon suits. Some are pretty much people would refer to as a raincoat. But today is more about respiratory protection. Okay. We have more than 200,000 items of disposable respiratory protection. Um, they obviously have very focused uses. And, and unfortunately, in today's world, um, there's a high demand for some of that sort of stuff. We have more than 10,000 full face respirators. And as I explained, the rural side of the, the research, we are likely to end up with about 18,000 full face respirators in, in, in our agency. So for a fire service, that's uh, rather unusual, but other than SCBA, of which we have about 4,000 odd of those, okay, full face APRs and PAPAs, we have a few hundred of them, okay, are a key element in our business. Now, full face APRs by themselves sound really nice. It's the logistics and the training and the decision-making that really comes to play. Why are you using them? Where do we need them? How do we train people? How do we make sure fundamentally this stuff is available 24 seven? And of course, part of the other element to this in terms of capability maintenance is canisters. So we own tens of thousands of canisters. We are start to turn them over. Okay. Now you can't use respiratory protection realistically if you cannot detect and quantify the hazards that confronts the operators and you, and I think you can start to see why we have quite a strong scientific support for hazardous materials 
we own more than 3,000 detectors okay, of various types. You know, the very simple CO detector to high-end field portable GCMS type instrumentation, okay, or gas phase IRs, all that sort of stuff. And that is all about us bounding the problem at an emergency um, as we go through. I have my own technician who just looks after de detectors, okay. We have a very large maintenance and servicing operation within our organization. Um, fundamentally, risk protect protection is one of those things that has to have a zero failure rate. So we invest an enormous amount of time to make sure that happens. But why do we do all of this? Okay, that's fundamentally what we're here today to talk about. It's about a safer community. Okay. Ideally, I know I want to be all dressed up and nowhere to go, so I have no emergencies. The reality is. That's not going to be the case. We do have emergencies that we must confront and manage to protect both our responders and the community and the environment. Okay. But I don't want to be in forever in their reactive space that I confront a problem they've got to think about. I want to get into the predictive space. Okay. So part of all of this understanding exposures of firefighters and the community and other responders across the operational context that uh, we encounter is to start to predict likely exposures of firefighters in the community. And this is where this research starts to come into play. This is not a fundamentally one-dimensional problem, okay? Not everyone is at ground level. Not everyone is immediately around the incident or in the centre of the incident. So we've got varying degrees of exposures at either ground level or for a firefighter, they may be in the air, okay? Plus we have those exposures in what we will call that little red box, the, the fire ground itself, okay, or the, the incident hot zone. Then we've got responders around the edges, and then we have the community, okay, and we have to understand what all this stuff means. The aim here as an example is if we said this was a carpet factory or a warehouse, and I get notification that it isn't being involved in a fire, I want to be in a position where I understand what's burning, what does it likely produce, what are the effects of our extinction or extinguishment processes are going to be on that fire, the likely duration and spread of that fire, coupled with the, some of the building characteristics and the environmental characteristics. Okay, If I understand what's going to be made, the likely concentrations, and if I have good criteria uh, about what that actually means to me, I can then start to look at how do I manage this incident even before I've actually got there? So what sort of respiratory protection will I require for whom? Is it suitable, not suitable? Duration of its use, how do I manage the zones? What will that mean to the community? Can we shelter them in place? Do we have to evacuate them? Okay, are they at risk? Are there specific areas of the community that are more at risk than other areas? What does that also mean to responders who are going to work around it? Quite commonly, as an example, police officers will do traffic control. Some of them may actually be downwind. So what does that actually mean? So I want to be in a position where I get that notification of the incident. I can predict all of this. Okay, And I will say, based on this, the snapshot of research we're doing, plus a whole lot of other stuff we've been doing, we are a long way on the path to doing that. It won't finish. It's a journey. All of this is a journey. But we are on our way. And that, I hope, It'll give you a little bit of context of partly why we look at all of this, this stuff. Okay, so not to be facetious, but there are a few simple rules for emergency responders. Okay, we want you to go home uh, every night. We want you to enjoy your retirement. So rule one for all emergency responders, you must protect your lungs. Okay, now there's a simple way of doing that. And that's don't be there, okay? Time, distance, and shielding, whether it be a biological agent, chemical agent, whatever its origin, maybe from a fire or a spill, okay, or a deliberate release, okay? But you apply those simple principles of time, distance, and shielding. Unfortunately, they're administrative controls. So if you look at the risk control hierarchy, we're actually playing at the back end, not at the front end. So the elimination we can't do because we didn't cause the problem, okay? but we can start to look at some engineering controls and those sorts of things. Um, but fundamentally, when we first turn up to the incident, 
we really only have administrative controls to get things going. Okay. Next step is if I can't be there, then I need some form of respite protection. Okay. But we need to do that in conjunction with air detection. Okay. And we also need to appreciate the purpose of whatever that respite protective device is, its limitations, but also the operational environment. Okay. Now, otherwise, if you don't have a principle and a deep understanding of all of this, then you've got to apply some simple rule based uh, approaches. And you do see that. Okay. Firefighters, well, to most jurisdictions, or uh, including ours, okay, if in doubt, we'll go to SCBA and then work backwards from there. The next issue for us, okay, is now if we've protected our lungs, is we've got to protect our skin. A lot of these contaminants, and it really has only been in the last decade that it's really come to the fore for firefighters, and, and is Many of these contaminants can deposit onto your skin or your clothing or your accessories and become available to eventually get absorbed through your skin. Okay, now, rule three, if you ignore rule one and rule two, rule two, you could be in big trouble. Okay, and rule four, which is what mum always told you to do, stay clean, okay? Just because you're going to an emergency doesn't mean it's an excuse to get dirty. It might be fun uh, sometimes, okay, but, the rule of the game is to stay clean, protect our lungs, protect our skin. And it's about how we do that, okay? So if we know the rules, then we've got to think about how does it get to us? Okay, so we want to understand that exposure, okay? And this is how we're going to lead into the little snapshot about urban firefighting and then on to our rural firefighting from that perspective. So we need a source. Okay, as I said, fires are very complex. You've got products being generated. You've got a distribution of these products. It is not a simple one dimensional problem. It is a time problem. It is a ge geography problem coupled with a fire behavior problem. So you're gonna put all that into play, okay? So the important thing is if I'm characterizing the exposure of a firefighter, I'm not necessarily characterizing the fire environment. And I'll explain that as we go through. So I can measure stuff being generated in smoke, but that's not necessarily what the firefighter has been exposed to because of their practices. Okay. Because you, when you add heat, you can cannot stand up inside a fire very well. You've got to stay low. Okay. So there is that even that spatial distribution of products and heat from that point of view. So we can characterize the fire, fire uh, smoke environment to an extent, but what we're interested in is characterizing the smoke environment to which the firefighter is actually exposed to. Okay. Then if we know that, we want to know what that exposure means to them. Okay. And we also want to look at what do their work practices do to their ultimate exposures. Okay, so then that then influences operationally our selection of respite protection, our selection of skin protection, our selection of decontamination strategies or health surveillance, all of those things from there. So leading on with that, we get into the fun part. Okay, so urban fire exposure. So I'm gonna, we've been doing this for a, a, a long time time okay now there is a global concern within the firefighting community and it has got stronger and stronger okay and one can argue that it might reflect several factors but fundamentally as our workforce becomes far more educated they start to appreciate the complexity of things that get generated and the things that they are actually exposed to and like everyone they get rightly concerned about what does it actually mean to my health both immediately and in the long term okay so there is a huge volume of work now going on about understanding firefighter exposures and decontamination and all that sort of stuff particularly with their protective clothing but we can relate we're going to relate that to scbas and accessories from that point of view but it's important to realize there is a global concern. It does not matter whether you're in Sweden, the United States, the UK or Australia, firefighters are, are asking a lot of questions now, which is a good thing, 
There may not be a lot of answers at the moment, but hopefully I'm going to show you we've started to get some of those answers. So what did we do? As I said, we've been doing this for a long time. We've got a lot more sophisticated, but fundamentally when we started this, there was a lot of information about uh, heat protection from clothing and, and obviously the, the use of SCBA from that point of view, but there was really very little information about what firefighters were exposed to during uh, their activities inside a fire, okay, and whether those activities made any difference and the tactics and all that sort of stuff. So we wanted to know what was the fire ex a firefighter exposed to. And we looked at this for, in a couple of ways. If you think about it, the firefighter, we measured their exposures outside. We measured more than 140 chemicals. You can see the sorts of things um, on the slide there. Okay, we're very interested in PAHs from, from a skin perspective. But we wanted to know, did their clothing offer any resistance? Did the things, the smoke, particulates and chemicals get onto their clothing? Okay, did it go through their clothing? Did it get onto their skin? Now we can relate this directly to SCBAs. So you think about the padding, the, the cylinder, all that sort of stuff. Does that, those materials they get encountered to get onto those uh, accessories? Do they stay? Do they now pose a secondary route of getting these materials to firefighters when they're not expecting it? So we wanted to know basically outside, on clothing, inside, on skin, okay? Then we wanted to know well, what happens if they did it several times, okay? What happens if they just took their clothing off? Did the stuff come off? Did it become available for them to breathe or touch their skin, et cetera, okay? Was the skin a significant entry route, okay? So a lot of questions. Now, as I said, we've got a lot better at this, okay? And I'm going to show you we've done simulated residence, fires, office fires, factory fires. We initially just focused on extinguishment. We now do search and rescue, extinguishment and overhaul, which I think a few folks here will be quite interested in. Okay, so we wanted to know this information. Okay, so what did we do? We did a, a mixture of real-time measurements and sample collections for laboratories. They included, as you can see, VOCs, PAHs, aldehydes such as formaldehyde or aquiline, simple inorganics such as hydrogen cyanide. There is a, uh, a great concern within the firefighting community about the impact of hydrogen cyanide on them within a fire. Okay, If we were asking questions, I could explain all of that. Having, notwithstanding, we have another project um, where we've been looking at hydrogen cyanide and its interaction with skin, and gas-wise is not really a big issue Okay, but our, our list of contaminants that we can look at is almost infinite. Okay, but we have to prioritize some of it's the laboratory being able to do stuff, some is being able to measure stuff realistically. Okay, the, the key element here is this this sounds really easy to do. Just go and put a bunch of stuff on a firefighter and let them let them go in and do their job inside a fire. Okay. It's not that simple, okay? This is a really harsh environment. If you think even about passive or active air samplers, okay, will they even work? So can we believe the result that we get? Because these things are not designed to generally work where they're exposed to air that may be a few hundred degrees. So, and if you're relying on absorbing materials, do they actually absorb? So we had to think about all of this, you know, what were safe sampling volumes? Could they work, not work, et cetera? And so we ended up going with a, a multi-phase approach, taking snapshot air samples for the, a lab, as well as doing this, this uh, sample, active and passive sampling, okay, on the firefighter. We also had to be mindful how we attached it to the firefighter, okay? They are going into a fire. Therefore, if it goes wrong, the last thing we wanna do is have equipment on them that's going to impede their ability to stay safe or actually do their job. Now, we were very fortunate. We have a training facility where we are training firefighters all the time to work in fires. So we have access to uh, many respects other than setting up real fires out in the community. 
a facility where we can actually set up as close as we can to how they will approach it in in the real world. Okay. So, and I'm going to talk about um, as a result some industrial fire, but we need to just understand what that actually means. So, an industrial fire from from in this context of these experiments was we set up a, an IBC, which is a thousand liter container. We put about 150 liters of diesel into it, and we had it onto a spill pad. And that spill pad was so when the IBC broke and the fuel uh, flowed, burning, okay, it would also hit some other products, but it would not spread out across the floor and get the firefighter. If, if you can imagine and you see pictures of people at fires where it is, there is no visibility inside, if we have a running spill fire on top of the firefighters, this is not going to be a very successful experiment. Okay, safety is the key on all of this and to make it as realistic as possible. So we did a few experiments just to make sure that the volumes and all of those sorts of things, that there's no way it could actually go wrong and that the fire itself wasn't actually too hot that the firefighters would not actually go in. So there's a lot of work with our uh, training area to make sure that it actually worked. And that now is actually a scenario that we use for training firefighters. Okay, so but we're not going to focus on skin today. What we're going to do is really focus on the risk of protection side of it. So as an example of the results, so here's an example of that industrial fire exposure. Okay, uh, the graph on the right is average PAH concentration. Okay, so we've summed up the 28 odd PAHs we looked at. Okay, and this is outside and inside their protective clothing. Okay. And what you can see, there, there are two key elements to this. One is their exposures are enormous, okay? And I think people also need to appreciate their exposures. These exposures are not being incurred over eight hours or 10 hours. On average, a firefighter will spend less than 13 minutes in SCBA in a fire. This is the same here. So when you're looking at these exposures, Okay, um, and some of the values are, are quite high, even for individual chemicals. They're over very, very short time frames, coupled with heat and the elements of the firefighter themselves, their exertion, okay, the heat stress, all of those things, they start to add up. The other element you see to this is that um, notionally search and rescue has a higher exposure than extinguishment. But when you actually look at the, the bars, okay, you really cannot tell too much difference between them. Now, search and rescue is when a firefighter goes in to look for a, a person who's missing. They will take a hose line in with them. The rules are if it gets too hot, they need to put the hot water on, they'll go and put it on. Extinguishment, obviously, is they're going in to extinguish the fire. Okay, When we looked at this, and the variances are huge. Okay, between uh, firefighting teams. Okay, now these teams are allegedly doing exactly the same thing inside. Okay, now I used to complain to our instructors that when we were originally doing the original work, that we would get a three to six fold difference. And, and from a science background, it's like that really sucks. It's, you know, it's not great. And I, I didn't realize now having seen these results where the difference between the highest and lowest exposure was over 200 fold. Our instructors are actually very uniform in their approaches and very, very good inside these fires. Okay. What those differences tell us is that the way people act inside is probably going to be the biggest predictor of their exposures, which then leads into a whole bunch of other questions. Are the tactics that firefighters are applying inside fires the best for those particular circumstances? You also note that there is a huge difference between what's outside their clothing and inside their clothing. Okay, and you should also note that for overhaul, there's almost nothing. Okay, but from the firefighters and particularly fire investigators, they get very concerned about overhaul. Okay, and one of the reasons is that often all the, the respiratory protection comes off, uh, the fire's out, we're all okay. Well, what we show you very clearly, that's not the case, but we now have a, a, a 
a situation where we can understand the exposures and then start to go, okay, well, what forms of res respiratory protection actually are required? Less than 99% of the generation rate for PAHs occurs in an overhaul compared to obviously when the fire is going. You will see some because there is still some smoking going on. Okay. Now, the other element to this, and as I said, these are just snapshots. We have shown that these materials do deposit onto the skin, okay, which was not known previously, including benzoapyrene. So the skin is a viable entry route that needs to be protected. Okay. But on the left, there's another graph that shows you the PAH concentration, the airborne PAH concentration, and this is just the, the low end ones. Okay, but also it shows you the deposition of these same materials onto their protective clothing. Now we have done this for other accessories and we have cut up SCBAs at various times. Okay, but fundamentally what you can say is that whatever is they're exposed to is also going to get on their clothing, which is, means it's also going to get onto the SCBAs. Okay, so this is going to lead us into a question that I'm going to pose to people about the designs of SCBAs, but it also leads to major questions about the designs of their protective clothing, okay, their tactics they, that they adopt inside, okay. So it pulls up a lot of um, both ideas, but also very simple things that we can apply to protect themselves. Now, I'm not going to read all of this out. You can read that, okay. I'm just going to show you, uh, illustrate a couple of bits to it. Okay, one is overhaul, you will get airborne exposures, okay, but they're not as great as working inside the active fire. Okay, your protective clothing does offer a huge uh, protection against the ingress of the airborne contaminants generated in the fire, but it's not perfect. Okay. So what that means is that stuff will get to your skin. But importantly, PAHs, and we focused on PAHs, will deposit onto your protective clothing, components, and all those other things, okay, which then raises this question about cleaning, and it will also get onto your skin, okay? So the skin is an entry route, okay, through, through a number of pathways. Firefighter exposures will vary according to activity, okay, and that includes even with an extinguishment, are they holding the hose doing what they call indirect attack or gas phase cooling or um, direct attack? All of those things play a role in the likely exposure the firefighter is going to get. Now, okay, if you are unwise, you will not wear SCBA. Now, even though the United States OSHA and that tell you that it's an IDLH environment, we clearly showed that's the case, okay, with these exposures and these values on the heat, it is pretty obvious you must wear respiratory protection. Okay. For overhaul, you might be able to make some uh, variations. Okay. But then it's a case of what form of respiratory protection is that respiratory protection suitable? Okay. And then we also know that the VOCs are readily off gassed from clothing and accessories. Okay. Which then um, has other issues. And what we also found was that when we laundered this stuff, and you can relate that to, say, cleaning SCBAs, was that, and I'll put it in nice terms, could be improved, okay? It was clear that laundering was not as good as, as um, everyone had thought to be. We could actually measure stuff off-gassing from these materials after they'd been laundered. Now, that's not surprising, okay? It's a degree of how successful is laundering to the types of materials that people have been exposed to, okay? But the other element to all of this is that there really are no established guidelines, okay, to what is contaminated and what's not contaminated, which will relate to, and then what does it mean to be cleaned, okay? And then we have taken all this information to develop some guidance, the firefighters. Now you can actually summarize it. Okay, it is a nice pretty picture. Okay, fundamentally, what we are and, and here gonna look at is, is really the surfaces. Stuff gets onto the surfaces, it comes back off the surfaces. Now, from a firefighter, and you think of SCBAs and accessories, 
that means both contact, so I can get secondary contamination through contact. Some particulates, uh, depending on the nature of those particulates, can uh, re aerosolize So depending on their size and their interactions, you may get up to 30% of the particulates that were deposited onto surfaces, such as their clothing or their, their SCBAs and that what come back off. There is plenty of evidence to support that. And then there's the off-gassing of gases. So you get these things. So both we've got a secondary contact from a uh, exposure perspective, but we've also got the off-gassing and the rebreathing the stuff in when they no longer have risk of protection on. So you can think about they've come out, they've gone through their entry control procedures, they've taken the stuff off, they're now going to recommission an SCBA as an example. Okay, there's potential for this. The question is how significant is all of this? So we can describe it in a very simple um, way. It's actually a very, very complex picture, as you can see there. But uh, we've taken, I guess, the all the work we've been doing trying to make it simple ish for folks. Okay. So what about the practices? So based on this, and I said this is a snapshot. Okay. What can we do? Well, the first one is you've got to establish control zones. The firefighters will often talk about as a whole warm in the cold zone. They do that for hazardous materials incidents. You've got to do the same thing for a fire. Okay, to prevent people being exposed to smoke. Okay, if you're going to go into what we would call a hot zone, but that close to the fire, you need, you must don SCBA. Okay, you don't stand in the smoke. Okay, which seems pretty. Easy for that is that we know this stuff deposits onto clothing and surfaces. So straight away we're actually getting, and what does deposit is fundamentally representative of the smoke composition. Okay. We also know you've got to follow basic hygiene practices. Okay, wash your hands, wash your face, soap and water, and the and the reason for that is to keep the stuff from getting through your skin. PAHs slow are relatively slow through the skin, but they will get through, and skin is not uniformly the same thickness. Okay, so. Depending on where it deposits on your skin, the rate at which it can go through will vary. Okay. We also say to people, no matter what the incident, which includes bushfires, always have a shower after the fire response, put on a clean uniform. Now, we, if you take an example, if I can get you to shower within an hour after your exposure to PAHs and the average, uh, Permeation rate is around five to five and a half hours, okay, for the T half. Okay, I can prevent 90% of those PAHs getting through your skin by having a shower within one hour. I can't get it to zero. The only way I can get it to zero is not have you be in there, which was part of our first rule. Okay, but I can make a huge difference. Straight away, I'm decreasing all of these things. And now we do a we know this works, I guess is the piece I'm not going to talk about today. Um, we've obviously modified our practices at our training facility, and so we know this stuff works very, very well. But stay clean, always have a shower, and always regularly launder your gear and keep your other stuff clean. Now, the question is going to become, what does clean mean? Okay, so it's all very well to uh, have a huge bunch of reports and publishing papers and all that sort of stuff and talking to firefighters, but we need to put it in some simple guidance. Okay. Now here I've got given you a snapshot of a program we've been developing with the United States. Okay. It's free to all first responders and men's responders. Um, it's called the ERDSS. Okay. But we actually provide firefighter guidance in there in two and, and, and in this context, two ways, one about their skin, but also about selecting respiratory protective devices. And in some instances, we actually have information on the performance of the canister. So you can actually go through and choose what your likely exposure is or the chemicals you're going to be exposed to, okay, and then work out what sort of respiratory protection you require, okay, taking into the various rules, what works and doesn't work, okay. But all that firefighter stuff you can see on the right is – I can choose a fire, I can choose the type of operations I'm going to do, and it will tell you whether you need to be decontaminated, okay, whether your gear should be laundered, 
Okay, so it starts to change the game. We take all this basically decades worth of research and applying it into a very simple tool. Two questions, they're on the way to manage their exposures. And that's just a part of this entire software tool to enable them to make decisions at an incident. Okay, in some respects, you're taking away the scientific officer, so to speak, okay, but you're enabling this to be used by everybody and then you've got that reach back to phone a friend. So when I look at all of that, okay, this becomes a challenge that I want to present to the audience, both researchers um, and companies or manufacturers, is know all of these things deposit onto our clothing, deposit onto our equipment, okay? But do our designs, do the engineering of the SCBAs and other respiratory protective devices take this into account? So how do we design equipment to prevent it becoming contaminated or minimise the opportunities for contamination to occur on that device? Okay, now, why do I say that? You go and look at a fire truck, many places in the world will go and put their used SCBA back in the cab with the firefighters. Or well, they'll go and put it, change the air cylinder, and it's ready to rock and roll. They may clean it once a year, some places are, are after every job, but the degree of cleaning and the frequency of cleaning varies a lot. But if I can design it so I don't have to clean it, then I'm in a much better space. And, I, and if I can understand the types of things they're going to deposit onto it, which is going to be metal oxides, okay, particulates, PAHs, uh, some are looking at fire retardants, some are looking at uh, some other interesting complex organics at the moment. Okay, but if you can start to design stuff that minimises those opportunities to get onto the gear, then that makes cleaning yeah. Then the other question is, how do we clean it? So what is the recommended method to clean this equipment? Okay, And what does clean mean? Is it 75% clean? Is it 90% clean? What is acceptable? And how do we validate that so that it is easy for firefighters or other responders to clean their equipment and have confidence that that equipment actually is clean in inverted commas? We may not ever get to 100%, but we also need as part of our risk communication with firefighters and responders un for them to understand that clean doesn't necessarily mean 100% clean. It might be 75%, okay? But we can then, as a future body of work, look at that last 25%. Can we get there? And then if we combine it with trying to engineer out these issues, it puts us in a good place for the future. So what should our future look like? We should have respiratory protective devices that do not want or cannot, or contaminants cannot get onto them, or if they can, very little does, but they are actually very, very easy to clean. And we know the methods to clean them work and we can validate it. That's where we should be looking all of that. NFPA 1851 talks about cleaning. There are a few other standards internationally we should be looking at those and going, hey, is that far enough? How can we do this for the future? So I want to leave that, that challenge for everyone. That was my two-second version into urban fires. Okay. The other snapshot is wildfires. Okay. Now, there are a lot of urban firefighters around the globe, but now go and think about wildfire. Okay, these fires typically run for days, if not weeks. We see evidence of fires in Greece and Turkey at the moment, the United States, Australia is in what is arguably the, the quiet time of year for us, but it'll pick up uh, come September. Okay. But we have a huge issue with firefighters to protect it, it wildfires. Okay, it is a global issue, just like protecting urban firefighters. But you think about now what is available to protect wildfire firefighters. Okay, there is a recent standard in the United States 
that can be applied through the NFPA. But wildfires, are, I'm not going to say interesting, but they pose some challenges from a number of uh, areas. One is what is our exposure? So if I measure exposures here in Australia, do those results apply to the United States or Turkey or Greece or Portugal? Okay, so do their fires burn a little bit differently? The nature of the trees, are there some common contaminants that we can be sure turn up no matter where you are around the world? What are the contaminants of most concern? Okay, now you've got to combine that with the firefighter themselves. Okay, their age, their fitness, their hydration. These fires don't occur at 10 degrees, they're 30, typically 30 degrees plus. So it's hot. They're typically out there for a long duration. There are bouts of high physical exertion. All of these things, okay, lead to impacts on their exposures and some contaminants particularly carbon monoxide or another risk factor when you add in to these, to adverse health outcomes. So all of those things I just lined up uh, are all indicators of a risk for heart attack. And yet we know heart attacks are a big issue within the fire service, but we can start to relate these risk factors. If I can interfere with those risk factors, then I'm on a, a, good, a good pathway. So from our point of view in Queensland, we had this obvious question Okay, 10, 15 years ago, uh, well, yeah, 15 years ago, I'm getting old. Okay, we had very little in the way of risk protection that we could offer our rural firefighters and, and even urban firefighters that were dealing with wildfires. There were some ad hoc approaches, but we had very little understanding of the operational environment, what they did, how hard they worked, okay, what would be suitable, what would they accept, and what would not work. And could we get, I guess, the, the ideal solution, or were we going to have to get a solution that would have to become in stages? So as I mentioned at the start, you know, we have uh, more than 10,000 full-face respirators in our fire service at the moment, and we're going to go up to 16 or 18,000 with a commensurate turnover of canisters every year. So it's a huge logistics effort from that point of view. But this functionally is all about protecting our firefighters at wildfires. Okay? So I said, when I started in this organisation, there were no full-face respirators. Now we've got literally that sort of number. But how did we get there? Okay. So we took an approach where we needed to understand their exposure um, measurements. Okay. So we wanted to characterise their exposures. So what was being generated, what were they actually being exposed to? Because it was unlikely we could give them SCBA, we needed to understand what they did, how hard they worked. So we wanted to relate their respiratory rate to their work, to the types of combustion products they were exposed to. And then clearly, for those who are into the hygiene side of the house, we were going to use that information to look at occupational exposure limits. Could they be applied, not be applied? Could we? develop some guidance, or could we recalculate those exposure limits to suit this environment, which is exactly what we did, okay? And then coupled with that is what sort of respiratory protective equipment would work, what would be acceptable for firefighters, what were the issues around providing it, training them, maintaining it, all those, those little questions, which they seem like little questions, but they're actually very involved, okay? and Fundamentally, first rule is, was respiratory protection required? Okay, and then what type? Now, this is not finished. This is the, All of these things are a journey. Okay, I'm not sure we'll ever get finished, but, um, you know, I want to get pretty close to having the best understanding ever on all of this stuff, because remember my objective, that safer community. Okay, so we are still to do PAH depositions on clothing and skin. We have some information. Um, it's on our list to do, but today I'm just going to talk about the um, the respiratory side of it here. Now, the biggest issue is not all the PAHs and per se, it's carbon monoxide. It is without a doubt carbon monoxide, and that poses a bit of a, bit of a conundrum because everyone appreciates 
air purifying respirators are not typically intended for protection against ongoing exposures to carbon monoxide, particularly where the concentrations vary. Okay, you can see here we're getting up to 140 ppm. Our peaks were over 500 parts per million, which is one reason why we're giving the, the CO detector to our rural firefighters. Okay, but in this example here, you can see it goes all over the shop. As I said, we relate it to the, their activities. Okay, um, you can see here ignition is higher, extinguishing is higher, whereas patrolling and heavy smoke is, is, is high, okay, but less, but patrolling is a, is a less physical exertion activity as opposed to extinguishing the fire. So we took all of this information related their respiratory rates across a, a range of fires, their work, and they come back. We now have a guidance for our firefighters as to when to do stuff. We have a handle on um, what forms of risk protection to use. Okay, Clearly, we want the respirators or the canisters to offer very good protection against carbon monoxide. If you look at other contaminants, as an example, here's a VOCs. Okay, so this is generic volatile organics. Okay, the fire itself was uh, almost nothing. Okay, the spikes that you can see here is fundamentally when firefighters were refueling their drip torches with hydrocarbons, so basically a mixture of petrol and diesel, okay, or mucking around the exhaust of a two stroke engine or refilling the trucks. Okay, so they were the spikes, but the average. VAC concentrations are relatively low. But the issue here, and it's the same with the urban firefighter ex exposure, is we're not dealing with single chemicals. Okay, It is relatively simple to protect someone for an exposure of a single chemical. We're dealing with here with hundreds of chemicals. Okay, Their interactions get complex. You've got to combine it with the, the characteristics of the person doing the job and their, their activities. Okay. And it's not uniform. As you can see here, that relationship of VOCs and CO, it, it changes from position to position that that person is in. So how do I put in place as hopes with these massive changes? Okay, And that the guidance that we provide and the values that we apply actually make sense. Okay, So I said we now have guidance documents for our firefighters on when to select, how long they can work with various respirators and canisters and work rest cycles and all that sort of stuff. But it's not finished, I guess, the best way of putting it. We'll improve it, okay, and we need to add in some other stuff about hydration and all of those things as well. So what it really tells us is that there is some work to do in this area as well, okay. So... As I said, we've done all these things. We've calculated all these bits and pieces. We are rolling out our full face P3s at the moment. It, it's most suitable. Okay, even if the canister really didn't do nothing, it was just a particulate canister. The fact that it stops all the stuff getting onto their eyes and their faces and reflects heat is is great. The feedback we're getting, even with our noxious vapor canisters, is that they're insult on the lungs and their noses and respiratory system, they, it's nowhere near ever that it, that it was. They don't cough okay, the next day. They don't smell all that stuff that they used to smell. So it's made a huge difference. Okay, So the way we're doing this is that every rural firefighter you can see here uh, is getting fit tested. Okay, And that's an annual event. So they get their training, they get fit tested. Okay, the trucks then provided the respirators along with spare canisters and the guidance documents. They're trained how to use it. Okay, they're also reminded these are the places you cannot use this equipment. Okay, they are provided a CO detector so that we have some magic lines in the sand for them to step back. Because what we found was that even if you're getting exposed to 500 parts or 600 parts per million carbon monoxide, if you just took literally a step back, half a meter back, that concentration would change significantly. So what we're trying to do is, is reduce those high exposures to carbon monoxide 
you've got to be realistic about it. Okay. We have a huge logistics training sustainment program that goes with this. Okay. You know, you're not talking about stations that are in the middle of your urban city. Okay. These stations vary from those on the edges to some in, in, in a Queensland context uh, are almost in the middle of nowhere. Okay. So water and all those things are precious commodities from that point of view. But we have to make it work. Across our one third the United States response area, this system has to work for everybody. And that is a huge challenge for our organization to make that happen. But this is a massive effort. As I said, we're more than 10,000 at the moment. And I think we're, I think we're actually about 1,200 CO detectors at the moment. Okay, we're gonna go up to about 20, 2,800 CO detectors and somewhere near 18,000 APRs. And couple that with 20 to 30,000 canisters continually turning over. Okay, there's a massive effort. Okay, so as I indicated, carbon dioxide is the greatest contaminant of concern. It's also the most problematical for um, removing. Okay, which means there is some work to be done. Okay, we know the equipment provides protections for the lungs and eyes, so that's really, really good. And we always, as I said, encourage people to shower, but there's some challenges. Oops, I've gone backwards. Oops, I haven't. Okay, so there's, there's some challenges. How do we engineer and improve the respiratory protective devices for working around wildfires, okay? Is their heat protection sufficient, okay? Their, their ability, their comfort, okay? It's got to take into account the varied work rates, the responders, a massive variation in responders, their work duration, okay? Taking on, taking off, okay? How do they rehydrate themselves as they're wearing the stuff, okay? Their temperatures and humidities, these are low humidity environments when these fires typically occur, but they're high temperatures, okay? But we want to minimize or prevent contamination on the devices, they have to be easily cleaned. How do we know that that process works and how do we validate it? The canister design is a big one. How do we design canisters that remove CO and we can be confident that we can remove CO? The NFPA standard for wildfire risk protection provides some guidance on that. But it is a it is an area for both research and for companies, okay, there is a massive opportunity here because these things will go globally across the world. We can remove CO, we can remove these lower end, um, lower concentrations of VOCs, and if they can do it for functionally eight hours, which from our point of view is pretty reasonable, okay, that is great. So I'm going to so the challenge here is about how do we improve our respiratory protective devices, but in, how do we improve our canister design, okay, so that it is fit for purpose, okay, and it has to take into account our varied users, okay, you know, wherever you are around the world, you'll get people who are in their 70s volunteering to young 18, 15 year olds, okay, there's a great difference in their ability to cope with work rates and age and fitness, okay. And then how long should that canister last? What is an ideal duration for a canister? Maybe there are other factors that come into play, but these are challenges for us as a group to work our way through. So that gives you a snapshot into some work we've been doing with urban firefighting and also a snapshot we've been on some work we've been doing with wildfire um, firefighting. Okay, and then I'd show you, I'm just going to briefly show you some examples of work that we're doing at the moment is that we're slowly getting our heads around um, particulate measurements. Okay, what do they actually do? So uh, let me put this in context. Okay, so remember my objective about a safer community, okay? I have more than 25 years worth of air monitoring data that we've collected at urban fires um, around those fires, not obviously inside, but around the fires. So where firefighters are working into the community and all that sort of stuff. So when I talk about trying to predict exposures, the community are likely to occur, I've got a lot of evidence to support what I'm actually 
trying to do. One of the things we've been missing has been particulate measurements. Okay, and there is a couple of reasons for that. Okay, but I'm going to give you an example. Okay, and you can see here um, some measurements from a fire, but I'm going to give you this fire as an example. But I'm going to pose these questions. So I'm going to tie all of the skin protection, rest protection to these, hopefully in about five minutes. Okay, uh, we could probably spend quite a few hours talking about the reality of all of this. But here's an example of the fire. This is the picture of the facility. It's an abandoned facility. Okay, um, they had illegally stored tires. There is more than 12 tons of grease and other things sitting in there, which is one reason why it looks really good when it's burning. Okay, well, that's in an urban environment. It's a semi-urban environment with new subdivisions, your water supply issues. Now we got to think about Okay, how do we characterize the exposures here? Are we doing it for now? So to protect people now, or are we doing it for future reference? Okay, and what sort of, of that information are we gonna use for respiratory protection? So from all of this comes back to what's likely to be generated. So tire fires in Greece are gonna make PAHs, they're gonna make VOCs, they're gonna make CO, they make sulfurated compounds. Basically, they're gonna make a lot of stuff. So then I need criteria to apply. So what criteria do I apply? Okay. Do occupational exposure limits work? Do they work collectively, not collectively? Okay. What guideline values are there for particulates? How do I relate a particulate measurement to all of those measurements of individual chemicals? Or if I do generic chemical measurements, okay, what criteria do I apply for respiratory protection? Now, you've obviously got to do this literally in minutes we get out and we start measuring stuff but i can tell you now what we do is we set up what we call a hot zone a warm zone and a cold zone okay but this is a two-dimensional it's a ground level and it's also in the those firefighters are sitting or standing above those bits and pieces so if you go into the hot zone you must be in a scba okay the warm zone is an interface Cold zone, you shouldn't have to wear anything, but we know that because we will do air measurements to prove that is the case. Okay. And what you can see here is that on the top right is the PM 2.5s that we measured on the night. And this is not, this is around the fire, but also into the community. Okay. You can see here it spikes upwards of two milligrams per cubic meter. What we found is that when we look at all of this, basically 90 more than 90% of the particulates so are less than PM1, okay, which is, is quite interesting in itself. Okay, now what values do we apply? Okay, because I'm looking at community protection a lot with these values on the on the top right of the screen rather than our firefighters. Urban air shed values for PM 2.5 in Queensland at least at 0.3 milligrams per cubic meter is considered very uns it's not unsafe. Um, hazardous from an urban air shed point of view. You know, horrible air quality, okay? But there's really nothing for emergencies. And then we got to couple that in with how long are these folks are going to be here, plus all those other things from that point of view. Now, that's when the fire is burning well, okay? On the next page, so you can see, there's, in this case, this is examples of the spots that we actually measure at, okay? There are multiple cycles that we measured through here. Okay, we measured VACs, we measured a bunch of noxious gases, airborne elements, sulfur and nitrogen um, arsenics are usually relevant for these sorts of fires. Okay, but we repeated for basically over 12 hours, all this sort of stuff. But the reason, once I have the fire ground sorted, what I'm interested in is this community. Okay, so how long is this fire going to go for? Okay, how bad is it going to get? Are there at risk community people? Okay, what are, this, what are their buildings like? So are their buildings resistant to ingress? Okay, what are the environmental conditions like? Are they going to change? Okay, so what criteria should we apply? Okay, when can they stay? So when is it safe? When can they shelter in place? And when can they evacuate? You can see here in the, in the, the uh, PM 2.5s, this is when the fire is basically what we will call the the overhaul damp down phase, OK, 
okay, we were getting spikes up to 30 milligrams per cubic metre immediately around the fire, very little in the community, okay. So we know that the hazardous area shrunk basically to around the fire. It was more a nuisance post uh, out of the fire zone. But what that meant with all of this sort of stuff, I can now get an idea whether people can wear respirators walking around warm zones or have they be an SCBA. So I can apply all this information to that selection of respiratory protection. And all of that work that we talk about for wildfires and those urban exposures it all builds back into this selection at the fire ground. The piece and the challenges I gave, or well, hopefully I'm giving everyone, okay, about engineering out the ability of SCBAs and other respiratory detective devices to either absorb or adsorb airborne contaminants, okay, and how do you clean it and how do you know it's going to be clean, all apply here, okay. Smoke from tyre fires, as I said, are full of benzene, PAHs, sulfurated compounds that have a very, very low odour threshold. They, when they deposit or are absorbed by the ECBAs, they are very difficult to get out. Okay, And firefighters will smell the stuff even after you've cleaned it. And then we get the question, is it clean, is it safe? So that starts to relate back to those challenges. So what are the ideal uh, cleaning methods? But this, you know, as I said, we could spend a few hours just talking about actually the, the selection of respiratory protection and community protection strategies at, at fires, particularly big urban fires, okay? But this gives a, just a two second view, but I wanna leave you with the, the thought that if you get put in that position, that, that fire is going, you've got to put your head through what's likely to be generated, how's it going to impact people, okay, what do we need to do to protect our staff? Okay, that's all got to be decided initially in, in literally minutes, and then the air detection comes and backs all that up. Okay, So that predictive cycle, as I said at the start, about a safe community, understanding all that work we've and data we've generated over the last 25 years feeds into this. So the summary is realistically, we have an ongoing program to understand and characterize the exposures of our responders. It will never finish, okay? The operational environment continues to involve the threats that firefighters and other responders uh, confront continue to evolve. So we have to understand and stay ahead of that. But there are some areas that we do very well and there's some areas we need to improve, okay? We need to improve our understanding of risk protection, but the devices, okay, and minimise their potential for contamination, okay, improve how they're cleaned. And then there's some other bits. How do we start to put together, and it's a, it's a great question, uh, in terms of how do we start taking particulate measurements? What do they actually mean? How do we relate that to all the other measurements? What is the ideal uh, measurement spread for a community protection and emergency response? Um, and how do we share all that around the world so it becomes a uniform approach? The UK have been doing stuff. The United States does stuff. There are pockets. Okay, Europe does stuff as well. Australia does. But how do we start to get some consensus globally on all of those approaches? So uh, just for everyone's benefit, because that was a recording, we've already uh, indicated our great thanks to uh, Dr. Mike Logan. I hope you found that presentation very useful. Looking at the chat, uh, it's very much instigated a discussion around fit testing, which is great to see. And, and Karen, thank you very much for answering some of the questions. In terms of your initial question, Oliver, uh, Queensland Fire and Rescue Service are very progressive in their respiratory protection program. I've visited them several times in the past, uh, and they do actually do annual fit testing, as, as Mike indicated in his presentation. Uh, so uh, in terms of UK service, I know some fire services do 
do fit testing, but I'm not sure if it's all because uh, the ones that I, I've dealt with in the past have been quite specialist in terms of they, they have other responsibilities other than routine firefighting. So I'm, I'm very happy to be involved in that conversation with Karen outside of this, outside of this webinar, which again is, is one, of the, one of the plus points of the webinar series that it's stimulating further discussion around uh, respiratory protection. So just to conclude the webinar, uh, just to go back to the, the final few slides, uh, if anybody has any further questions for Dr. Logan, he's very much kindly agreed to answer any questions offline. As I say, he sends his apologies that he can't be here today. So I'm happy whether you send them to myself or to uh, Mike Williams, the secretary of ISRP. We're very happy to forward those on to Dr. Logan and he will answer them in due course. So as with all the presentations today, they will be on the section website. Uh, and we will put the answers to any questions that anybody has on there as well, along with the recording of today's session. So just finally, uh, future webinars, there's a bit of a break as, as we get towards the end of the summer. The next webinar is on confined space, the hidden hazard on the 7th of October, where we will be having keynote presentations from speakers from 3M, ESS Salesforce and from Sanofi on the hazards of confined space from a respiratory protection perspective. Uh, and then the final one of 2021 will be on radiological hazards where we are working in partnership with the Society for Radiological Protection to deliver this webinar. So that will have keynote speakers and case studies from across the nuclear world. Uh, and just finally, to give people, we are looking our 2022 program already. So if there's any ideas, themes, or volunteers for presenters that anybody can think of, uh, please contact myself or the secretary. The details are on the slides, will be on the slides, which everybody will get a copy of these. And with that, I'm very happy to conclude today's uh, webinar. I'd just like to say a big thank you to all our excellent presenters to Dr. Mike Logan, to Eric, uh, and to Claire for what I thought were exceptional presentations. Uh, and also thank you to all our attendees for, I hope you found today's webinar useful and uh, we look forward to seeing you again at, at a future event.